So the terms introvert and extrovert get thrown around a lot these days. And when trying to define what these terms actually mean, there were generally two different schools of thought. One school of thought is generally more focused on behavior. An introvert is an introvert because they do this or they do not do this. And within this behavioral field, there are two different approaches. The first approach is archetypal and posits two binary extremes, whereas the second approach places introversion and extroversion on a spectrum. So first of all, let's examine the first approach within this school of thought. Well, within this first approach, the extrovert archetype is so incredibly energetic and enthusiastic, has such an abundance of energy and confidence. You know, the image that comes to mind when you picture extrovert, the image generally perpetuated by the media. Well, if this highly unrealistic ideal, if you like, of what it means to be an extrovert is the accepted definition, well, I've got to tell you, most people would be an introvert. Because within this particular two-dimensional approach, anyone who can go extended periods by themselves, anybody who needs to recharge, anybody with a hint of introspection, and indeed interest in that which lies beyond the superficial epidermis of sensation, is going to be an introvert. I mean, why do you think all of the videos directed at introverts perform so well? Do you really think extroverted people, which in reality is going to be about half the human population, have no interest in self-exploration, aren't typing personality tests online? Well, yeah, they're typing in personality tests, but even those who receive an extroverted result within the cognitive spectrum, which we are going to get to in a minute, identify more with the traits listed in a video directed at introverts than a video directed at extroverts. Because again, within this two-dimensional pop culture representation of introversion and extroversion, extroversion is completely unrealistic. Do such people exist? Absolutely. I know a few myself. But they are in the minority, not the majority. But you know, that is only the representation of two different binary extremes. Most people who are acquainted with this topic understand that within a behavioral model, introversion and extroversion exist on a spectrum. And it is within the second approach, which I would argue is the central approach of behavioral psychology, that systems such as the Big Five place personality traits on the spectrum, and in the case of extroversion, define a person as extroverted relative to the degree to which they are comfortable socializing, and that's a big one within this system, and putting themselves out there into the external world. And even systems such as MBTI measure extroversion in a similar manner, seeking as they are to straddle the gap between behavioral traits and cognitive functions. It does not have the exact same definition you understand, because of course it is trying to incorporate cognitive elements, but it is still not a purely cognitive model, using as it is the four dichotomies. But even those people watching this video who know themselves to be an extroverted type within a cognitive function-based personality model will not necessarily relate to this, for example, big five definition of extroversion may very much consider themselves within that particular behavioral definition much more an introvert at heart. Because you can have extroverted dominant functions while still being in a behavioral sense very much an introvert. Which brings us neatly to the cognitive school of thought. Because this school is not so much concerned with your behavior as it is your cognition. What's actually going on inside your head. The internal process is driving the behavior that would be measured within the behavioral school. And within this cognitive school, it is highly possible for an extroverted type to be in every way, shape and form, highly introverted within a behavioral based model. Because within a cognitive definition of introversion and extroversion, it is highly possible for an extrovert to spend a prolonged amount of time in an internal dialogue. It is highly possible for an extrovert to become drained by external stimuli more than say, an average person to such an extent to acquire prolonged amounts of time recharging in solitude. And many, many, many extroverted types, particularly those types with, say, extroverted thinking in their dominant stack, wouldn't necessarily be that sociable. And indeed, many extroverted types with an extroverted feeling function may experience a level of anxiety sufficient to effectively inhibit their willingness to engage fully with the world around them. And of course, vice versa. And this is not to say there is no behavioral overlap whatsoever between cognition and measurable extroversion. Of course there is. Many people who have extroverted dominant functions will receive 
an extroverted score within MBTI will score highly on extroversion within the big five. However, there yet remains a significant amount of introverts who will type even within MBTI as an extrovert because they are highly sociable and willing to engage with external reality. And conversely, an equal amount of people with an extroverted dominant function who will receive an overwhelmingly introverted score from an MBTI test and indeed a big five test. And I'm not saying these people are a majority, but they certainly aren't a minority either. I mean, why do you think so many ENTPs mistype as INFJs? So many ESTJs mistype as INTJ. So many ISFPs and INTPs as ENTPs. These aren't exceptions and they aren't the norm. They're somewhere in the middle. And the reason for this is there is only a small overlap between your cognitive functions and your behavioral output, particularly in regards to the behavioral output which is sought to be measured in order to define your personality traits. However, this dilemma I am here positing does not require a complicated solution. And indeed, the cognitive definitions of introversion and extroversion that I am now putting forward are no more complicated than those within a contemporary behavioral setting. So in deciding whether or not you have an extroverted dominant function, however you might score within a, for example, big five test, which by the way, the 16 personalities test falls under, you must look to the extent to which you are cognitively, yes, cognitively, not behaviorally, reactive over proactive. Because of course, within a cognitive function-based model, everyone is both an introvert and an extrovert, and are therefore both cognitively proactive and cognitively reactive at the same time. But an extrovert's dominant state will be overwhelmingly reactive. And conversely, an introvert's dominant state will be overwhelmingly proactive. And the degree to which a person can do both will be relative to the degree to which they can comfortably activate their opposing functions. Introverted functions in the case of an extrovert, and extroverted functions in the case of an introvert. However, as we are naturally predisposed to favor our dominant functions, it is again not a matter of observing your own behavioral output, as would be done within a more behavioral setting, but rather a matter of just feeling where you are most comfortable. So first let us explore cognitive reactivity, the primary domain of the extroverted type. A reactive cognition is one which essentially synthesizes the act of interaction and the act of observation together. Because of course an extroverted sensing dominant type, an ESFP and an ESTP for example, will be observing the substrate they are interacting with. They are not just diving in blindfolded and flailing their arms around in the dark. No, the extroverted sensing dominant, the extroverted feeling dominant, the extroverted intuitive dominant, all of the extroverted types predominantly inhabit a cognitively reactive state whereby they are perceiving reality and reacting against it. An ESFP will be interacting with the tangible concrete world, inhabiting a relatively, and I say relatively because this is technically the most abstract out of all the time frames, present tense state, bouncing off external perceived components in order to embody one's maximal individuality. They might be refining a skill set. They might be engaged in an art or craft. They might be dipping into their more dormant, extroverted feeling state in order to enjoy the company of their loved ones. Again, bouncing off, reacting against the world around them, while the proactive cognitive state, which we are going to get to in a moment, plays a more supportive role. The same goes for codec dominance as well. An ENFJ will oftentimes be anchoring into the here and now, dipping down into extroverted thinking as much as is necessary in order to meet the expectations and uphold the values of their respective community and cultural archetypes they aspire towards. An ENTJ and an ESTJ who so often times receive an introverted result within a personality test will oftentimes be engaged with their work, so often times removing themselves from people so that they can concentrate on the task at hand, going down rabbit holes of research, finding new connections in the external world. In the case of an ESTJ coming up with new and innovative systems, as opposed to the oftentimes more macroscopically oriented ESTJ, will often be following a more straightforward trajectory with the more extroverted variants of this type embodying with their more secondary, proactive cognitive state, the archetype and force of personality they require in order to aid their primarily reactive state as it dips into extroverted feeling in order to exert maximal charismatic influence upon the human components required in order to realize a very specific goal. Whereas the reactivity of an extroverted sensor such as an ENFJ and ASTP may be much more focused on a specific portion of much more tangible reality the cognitive reactivity of an extroverted intuitive, such as an ESTJ and ENTP, 
maybe bouncing off and reacting against multiple different external components at once. And indeed, so often times, all of these extroverted types require prolonged times alone, with which they are oftentimes very comfortable, by the way, in order to engage those tasks and dive down rabbit holes of research that they would not have been able to in a company of others. So you can see now how it is possible to have a predominantly extroverted cognitive makeup and still be very much classified as an introvert within such models as the Big Five. And again, it is perfectly possible, although I might argue somewhat more rare, for somebody with a predominantly introverted cognition to be classified as very much an extrovert within these particular spectrums of behavioural psychology. Because a cognitive introvert doesn't necessarily need to be a complete recluse in order to effectively engage their primary functions. Because while an introvert will not necessarily be displaying extroverted characteristics when they are in their default state, the individual with a predominantly introverted cognition may still be sufficiently comfortable with their opposing functions, which are in this instance extroverted functions, to be able to go prolonged amounts of time, confidently and comfortably, putting oneself forward full throttle into the external atmosphere. And indeed within this external world, very comfortably socialising with complete strangers. However, even the most confident and outgoing introverted type still has a cognition which is predominantly introverted and therefore much more proactive, cognitively speaking, than it is reactive. And even when they are engaged in their most extroverted state possible, there will oftentimes still be an ample amount of proactive internal dialogue being instigated within the introverted cognitive type. So what then is a proactive state? Well, this is a state of minimal interaction with the external world. It is no more or less creative, abstract, or intellectual than a reactive state. But those patterns and associations that would have been found within an external atmosphere in the case of a reactive cognition, or instead being predominantly, because of course this person still has a reactive component in the opposing stack, being formulated within the internal world. Because a proactive state does not require interaction with the world around you nor even inspiration from it. And a cognitively proactive individual will oftentimes be envisioning future outcomes, potential courses of action, far more than they oftentimes will be pursuing them. Because a proactive cognitive state is autonomous from the external world. Many extroverts will identify as introverts within a behavioural spectrum, but even when they are in complete solitude, their cogitations, their creative pursuits, their expenditure of energy will still be directed more externally, reacting as they are against the external perception, than they are internally. Whereas the cognitive introvert, being as they are predominantly proactive, will not be reacting against the external world as much as they will be in terms of comfort, first filtering that information which has been up to this point passively observed through their divergent opposing functions, through an oftentimes highly conscious awareness of values, identity, objective frameworks, those internal constructs originating from the self. And the conscious experience of these filters will oftentimes enact a scenario within one's mind before that scenario will ever come to light in external reality. So in terms of understanding whether or not you are more introverted or extroverted within a cognitive field, you must determine the extent to which your dominant cognition is more reactive than it is proactive. The ratio between proactivity and reactivity within your brain. Because whereas a cognitive extrovert, an ASTP for example, more within their ideal place rather than for example a quarantine, are reacting against external stimuli and forming new innovations and associations upon them than they are engaged with an entirely internal dialogue. And in terms of proactivity, it is actually highly possible for say an ISFP for example, when engaged in a social setting, to still be inhabiting a predominantly proactive state as they seek to constantly relate themselves to the stimuli they are intaking. So thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you made it this far. Thank you, you are awesome. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to let me know by hitting that like button. And be sure to share it with anyone who you think might find it informative or interesting. If you haven't already done so, be sure to click that subscribe button down below with the bell icon next to it, that way you can stay notified of future content. If you are interested in understanding this cognitive approach to personality on a deeper level, I highly recommend you check out the CPT ebook. And if you are uncertain about your type or just like more information as to how your type pertains to you, I highly recommend you check out my type service and consultations. And finally, CPT is on Patreon, so if you're interested in supporting the channel in theory on that additional level, 
That would be massively, massively appreciated. But it goes without saying, I already massively appreciate your support over this platform as well. So that's it for me, and I'll be back in a few days' time. For now, take care of yourself.